Another thing that I think most of us can agree on is that we don't want to be supported by the government. Hmm. I think most Hispanics take pride in doing their own thing. Hmm. Go to, you know, I was in Dominican Republic several years back, driving down the countryside. Every three or four miles, you'd see somebody that would take the time to climb the tree and get the coconuts. Chop them up and serve them on ice. Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, that level of industriousness is innate with Hispanics. This idea that there is a big brother government or that the government will be our daddy is not a mainstay of the Hispanic culture. So I think when you have a frank conversation with Hispanics, most of them will say, yeah, right on, you're right. In the eyes of Rich Valdez, why do Hispanic Americans predominantly vote for left-leaning candidates, even though they actually tend to have more conservative values? Why is access to a good education the most important factor in success? And how has progressive ideology taken over higher education? How is it that so many Americans embrace socialist and communist policies? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. Today we sit down with conservative political commentator Rich Valdez, who is Mr. Call Screener on The Mark Levin Show. He shares his incredible journey from starting a business at 16, to founding a charter school, to working for Governor Chris Christie, to becoming host of the podcast This Is America. Rich Valdez, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thanks, Jan. You know, you're an associate producer with the uh, Mark Levin Show, actually Mr. Call Screener <laughs> Guilty for <as> many <laughs> people <laughs> out there. But you actually, you have your own podcast, which I understand has been growing exponentially, that's basically targeting Hispanics. Yeah, so This Is America is, is for everyone, but we do want to include so much of the growing population of Generation X and millennial uh, voters that are looking to get information on issues. And it's definitely something that we, when we create the show, we want to reach them in every episode. I'm going to go into talking a little more about uh, your show and, and some of your kind of sure. philosophy of life or something a little bit. But tell me a little bit, you, you have a fascinating life story. You actually come from, you know, quite humble origins. Yeah, so I was born in the late 70s in what was back then called Brooklyn Jewish Hospital. And, you know, the early 80s, early 90s was a challenging time in New York City. My parents, my mom had a cleaning service. My dad worked in a cardboard factory until he became kind of permanently disabled. And uh, they both died before their time. So it was, it's been an interesting journey, you know, with my background. But I, one of the things that stands out to me today where I don't have to do that, and I'm grateful that I don't have to do it with my kids, is... Going up to a truck in the 80s, and out of the back of the truck, they were giving out blocks of government cheese. And I remember doing that with my siblings in the 80s. I can't stand that stuff, by the way. We loved it. uh, Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) It's all we knew at the Uh time, right? And and this was, you know, our our dad was in the home. This was a, a big program they had where they were trying to add nutritional value into the certain communities. Right. So, you know, it was just an interesting thing, and we thought it was the coolest thing ever, this orange cheese that came in, like, in a cardboard box wrapped in this blue stencil-lettered uh, Shelf cellophane. Shelf life of 10 years. Something right? like that, yeah. 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 So it, it was just interesting to... I, I, I reflect on that a lot because I think to myself, man, only in America you can start from the bottom and work your way up. That's just not the case in so many countries today. So you actually had a kind of a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, shall we say? Sure. Well, you know, growing up, um, you know, like you said, from humble beginnings and uh, we didn't have as much as we always wanted. So uh, as a teenager, there was always things I wanted. There was always a new pair of Timberland boots I wanted or a new pair of sneakers I wanted. And I couldn't rely on my dad or my mom to get those for me. So I... I did things, you know, lots of different things to, to get money. And one of the things that I did, and it started out as a kind of a hobby, was drawing designs with uh, hair cutting clippers in the side and the back of people's hair. And my buddy was 
taking a graphics course in high school and had to make a flyer for an imaginary business. Mm -hmm. And he did that with me being the subject of his business I and see. he put my real phone number on it. Uh -huh. So before you knew it, that, you know, we had probably 2,500 kids in my high school. Mm -hmm. There were flyers going all around the school saying that you know, I was giving out these haircuts and I ran with it. And I did it, and you know, so as a teenager, I was cutting hair in my dad's bathroom in his apartment. We had moved to Jersey, and I did that, and I developed a, an actual clientele, and went from high school to to actual cosmetology school to learn this craft, and opened a barber shop, and got into other business after that. And it was a really interesting experience because at the time, I thought, hey, I could do whatever I want. The world is my oyster. And, and I still feel that way to some degree, but I look back now and I'm like, wow, 16, you know, and that's when I kind of got bit by the capitalism bug, if you will. So, you know, and that's also very interesting because you didn't, you didn't feel like you had these limitations no. then. No, good parents. Okay. That I can say my parents always told me, my dad always told me education was key and you know, it was knowledge. Knowledge was power. I needed to know things. Um, and I did. So I, I learned as much as I could. And my mother was just, you know, there, there was nobody better than me, right? <laughs> she, she gave me all of this self-assuredness that, that any kid could have ever asked for. So between thinking I could do whatever I want and succeed at it, and my dad telling me that, you know, focus on business, focus on technology in the future. And this is a guy with a sixth grade education from Puerto Rico that worked in a factory, you know, and, and enjoyed drinking lots of beer. Uh -huh. So, you know, it, it was interesting where you, you would take bits and pieces of what your parents tell you and you're like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But eventually I think they were both right. And it's part of the reason I love this country as much as I do. And so, you know, somehow you went from uh, basically doing hair to working in Chris Christie's office, the governor's office. Now, wh wh how, how did that happen? Yeah, so after uh, the bar I started the barbershop and, and did that for a number of years, it went well, uh, trained some new people, had some employees that came on board. And, you know, it was really an honor, I think, to create jobs for people locally. That was something that made me really, really proud. Hmm. In addition to that, I was developing and growing a business. So I was eventually able to, to sell the business assets and get into a new opportunity that I invested in, which was selling cell phones on a really busy uh, commercial street in Jersey, Bergen Line Avenue. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a while. And you know, I was very successful with haircutting and I was successful with the cell phones for a while, but I also lost my shirt with the cell phones. So you know, th there's, there's ups and there's downs, there's peaks and there's valleys. And uh, I've had, I really consider it not only the pleasure, but an opportunity to have witnessed and experienced both. Well, then how did you end up, you know, basically? As a small business owner, there were, Urban Enterprise Zone, different people from the local government that gotten involved uh, with reaching out to local business owners. So that was my first foray, meeting with politicians and realizing when you're in business for yourself, oftentimes you're going to have to meet with the local politicos. So I did that and for a number of years I was um, tangentially involved in local politics and from the outside. And around 2003-ish, 2004-ish, I decided uh, to support the re-election campaign of President Bush and worked on the campaign in Derry, New Hampshire okay. and met a lot of really cool people uh, through the uh, Republican National Committee and it, it was it was really eye-opening at the time it was campaigning at its best and the president won and I went to the inauguration and kept in touch with a lot of people after that I had uh, done some work with uh, then the most conservative member of Congress, uh, Congressman Scott Garrett, mm -hmm. and it just opened my eyes to realizing that th there's so much impact that we can have in so many different areas, whether it's through higher education, through government service, or through working in the media. And those are the three areas that I think I've always wanted to work in. So I kind of made it my business to make sure that whatever I was doing, I was always involved in one of those areas. Fascinating. And then that. So and then that's what ultimately led that you parlayed. Into the yeah, I, I spent side, a yeah. lot of time with. Um, mm -hmm. Forgive me for uh, speaking over you, but the the work that I did there 
kind of catapulted me into higher education, mm. dealing with working adults, dealing with folks that wanted to go to trade schools and make their lives better. And I did that for a number of years. And it was at that time that the folks from the Christie campaign reached out and said that they were looking for somebody who was working in higher ed to uh, guide some of the governor's campaign staff at the time through uh, an event at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I did that, and it was a Chamber of Commerce event, and I met a lot of people, and they liked me, and when the governor got elected, they uh, offered me a job. It was a job that I wasn't able to accept because I had children at the time, and um, they were small. I still have children, but they were younger. And it was uh, working in the governor's office, working as a director of faith-based affairs. But one of the things that the governor did was he had a commitment to slashing salaries. And what I was making in a nonprofit was still more than what I would have been making working in the state house. Uh, in the governor's office in that in that role. So I decided to pass on that, but a few months later, another opportunity ar arose to work uh, with uh, programmatic management and helping them to create the messaging campaign, if you will, to reach certain constituents. Digital advertising, basically. Well, yeah. more so with actually, I'm gonna use the word lobbying, mm -hmm. people inside of the administration, mm. because it was a time of deep uh, cuts to the state budget. So we had to kind of secure the program that I was dealing with uh, and overseeing in northern mm -hmm. New Jersey was called the Family Success Centers. So there was 14 of those centers and by the time I was uh, done with that, that um, role, we had 40 centers. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the unique part about it was that they were slashing budgets for so many different social programs, but this one was unique in that kind of like the old adage, and uh, I believe this is attributed to Maimonides, which is teach someone, you know, give a person a fish and they eat for a day, teach them how to fish and they eat for a lifetime. And that's what the Family Success Centers focused on, was helping people do what they wanted to do. They didn't uh, come in and tell you, hey look, whatever issue you're having in your family, we're here to fix it. It was a very voluntary thing and it was designed to be led by parents and led mm. by the community. So whatever you wanted it to be in your community, the, the government gave a small grant to kind of start this community center, but from there, this family success center was all on you to, to do, to run, to create, to expand. And our job was really just to provide technical assistance and give you the help that you needed. So I, I loved the idea, the concept of that, and that was what I did um, as a full-time staffer in the Christie administration. Upon leaving, the Christie administration, I took a role outside of the State House and the Capitol overall as a advisory board member to the Center for Hispanic Policy Research and Development, which is part of the New Jersey Department of State, okay. which I still uh, am a member of. And dealing with exactly with that, they help students, Hispanic students, to experience what government is like, to help them realize their full potential, to help them get to the next step of whatever it is they've identified in their career. And among other things, they also provide micro grants and different things for social service agencies. So uh, it, it's uh, work that I enjoy. I'm not as active as I once was because of my work in media. And leaving the administration, I began writing a column with the Washington Times, and that opened the doors to doing really interesting work that was a kind of a slash between media and management where I worked with uh, an educational nonprofit uh, called Project Veritas and training people to be citizen journalists that would go out and get the goods. With, with video cameras. <laughs> yes, video cameras, yes. hidden cameras, mm -hmm. really trying to uh, expose a lot of the corruption, a lot of the things that oftentimes you wouldn't see unless you took the fly on a wall approach. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting to me is that Hispanics as a group are typically portrayed as somehow left leaning, voting that way. Um, whereas you, obviously, you know, you went to work for the most conservative member of Congress, as you described yeah. at the time. 
How is it that uh, you came about your value system, or is there just is there something missing in my understanding here? Yeah, well, you know, I think you raise an excellent point, and this is part of the reason we do the This Is America podcast and why I speak as much as I do, because people constantly mischaracterize the values, the the origins of of what being Latino, what being a Hispanic really is. So much of the church, in particular the Catholic Church, is involved in, in and intertwined in our culture, in our everyday life. So to make any type of statement that suggests that Hispanics, Latinos are not pro-life, are not very religious, very faithful people, would be grossly erroneous. It's important, I think, that we tell that message and we share that story so that people really realize Hispanics are way more conservative than they're given credit for. But they don't seem to vote that way. Yeah. At least, that, again, this is, for, this is from what I'm told, and certainly this is what a lot of the, the data has been showing in the past. 100%. Right? And this is, I think, one of the enigmas that you see in life. It's ideally, I think, linked to politics. People have played politics with different Hispanic groups over the years. So the oldest probably being the Mexican group and, you know, following that the Puerto Ricans and then following that the Dominicans and then, or I should say, the Cubans predating that. And the Cubans are a good example that came out of socialism in a communist country. Mm -hmm. So, so many Cubans that you'll meet in southern uh, Florida, in Miami, they'll be the first ones to tell you. They've risked their lives on an inner tube, on a piece of foam, right. on anything they could to get out of the despotism that was Cuba. So when you have it in the United States and you have a second or third generation uh, Hispanic person that's deciding to vote a certain way, I think it's really just a failure of messaging. It's a failure of outreach. It's a failure of reaching people. Overall, it's not just Hispanics that have become more left-leaning as, as they spend more time in America. It's all Americans. I think you saw radicals in the 60s, uh, from Noam Chomsky to Saul Alinsky principally, that really put out a message geared towards taking over institutions like the media, like the university system, public schools, unions, and so many different layers of our government, state, local, and federal government. So when you have this onslaught of activism geared towards taking over these institutions, just like they did in so many communist countries, what do you do? So many people that consider themselves conservatives are busy driving trucks, being nurses, living their lives, working in private industry, not looking for a handout from the government. But you have these people that have created this new culture. So I think there's a really serious culture war going on mm -hmm. and Hispanics, because they're newer Americans, and African Americans to some degree because of poverty linked to not having the same access to education is what has kept these groups where they are. So basically you're suggesting that the, there's been this shift since the 60s in terms For sure. of, and, and, but that has disproportionately affected uh, Hispanics and blacks? Quite simply. The more education that you have, the better off you are in fighting against this um, ideology, right? So I think it's an intellectual war that we're having, a battle of ideology. People that have been in this country for more generations have had the benefit of more education. Perfect example. My parents were born in Puerto Rico. They're born Americans, second generation, third generation Americans. Um, my grandparents were the ones that were born elsewhere. However, they weren't uh, part of a, of a family system that was uh, enabling them to get the education that they needed. So 
they voted however they were pretty much told to vote based on what happened in the neighborhood, and I saw this firsthand. My mother loved Ronald Reagan, but she voted for Schumer, <laughs> right? And he, he didn't run against, he just happened to be our, our congressman in the district that we lived in, and he used to pass by the house a lot, and she would always say, oh, hello, Mr. Schumer. So my mother was one of those Reagan Democrats that voted for Reagan and voted for Schumer. So the point that I'm making is when people have an opportunity to do what's right for their family, they're going to do it. But when people are held back by expanding housing and urban development through housing projects, when people are held back by giving them blocks of government cheese, when people are held back by giving them free stuff, it gives them less of a drive to do what they want to do in life because they're being given these things and they haven't seen what else there is in the world. Given that lack of education or barrier to education that you oftentimes see in some of the most challenged neighborhoods, this is what we get. So this is part of the reason I helped start a charter school in Jersey City, New Jersey, mm. uh, probably 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago, maybe next year it'll be 10 years, so nine years ago. And we did that in the most challenged area according to the statistics. Their statistics said that African Americans that earned this much money, that lived in a certain part uh, of the city were the least expected to succeed based on their criteria. We started the school to show them that everything they were saying was wrong. It doesn't matter where you come from as long as you have access to a good education. So oftentimes when you hear people use the term sentencing someone to poverty because of their zip code, I, I don't necessarily believe in that per se, but there is reality to it. If you have a failing school system in an economically impoverished area, how, how much success can you attain? It's going to be limited because you don't have the tools that you need to succeed. Presumably you're saying that given the current educational reality in that neighborhood, in that area, people didn't have a lot of chance for success, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that's what I'm hearing. Yes. But instituting this charter school somehow was going to help and how did it play out? Sure, so here we are nine years later and we see that our kids are performing better than the district school, better than many schools in the state. Not perfect by any means, but you st start to see kids in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, reading at their grade level and at a higher percentage, unlike the district, which just kind of accepts it. And I think the reason they accept it is because of these institutions that are in place. You have teachers unions that are looking out for teachers instead of looking out for students. There, I always say there should be a students union, right? Somebody should be looking out. And of course, that's the parents. But if the parents haven't had the benefit of education and they're just living the status quo that they know, this cycle perpetuates itself. So the real okay. way to get out of, of poverty and to bootstrap your way to success in America is through education, in my opinion. So, you know, and it's also a little bit counterintuitive because from, from what I've been hearing, a lot of very highly educated folks actually will also tend to be more on the left side of the spectrum. Because again, that's what I'm, that, that's, that's because they that, hijacked that's what told. higher education. So, so, but you're, you're telling me we need more education to kind of give people a broader We need more education and, and better education. Okay. So I think we need education that's rooted in the classics. I think we need education that focuses on where do we come from? Why do we have an America? Mm. How did America start? Who are the philosophers that influenced our founders? Why did they think the way they did? And I think when we can be well-versed in the anti-federalist papers, well-versed in the federalist papers, well-versed in the history leading up to our founding, now we all of a sudden have a, a better understanding of what we see in this picture, yeah. right? We understand what it is that this whole American experiment was intended to be, not a government state, not a police state, not 
something where everybody was going to be supported by this social experiment, but more so by a capitalist opportunity where people could make their own money, make their own way, provide for their families, and grow as they felt fit. I'm getting a sense now of, I think, why you went into media. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, it seem, you're obviously very passionate about education. Right? Oh, for and, sure. And you, you know, you've, you've been deeply involved in this one school in a district that meant a lot to you. Um, but, you know, wh when I hear about This Is America, right, I, I'm getting the sense that you're talking about a lot of the kinds of things on air or you know, on the podcast that you were just telling me. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's, what's interesting is to me these are all sub-issues of a larger issue. So I think understanding what America is and why America is and coming to a realization within oneself that asking yourself, do I love America? Because I think you either love America or you don't. If you, you don't ask yourself that question, I think you're taking a flippant position on what the rest of your life is going to look like. Mm. And you're, it's a misguided one where you then start to take apart things that were not meant to be taken apart. For example, what we're seeing right now with the Constitution being, in my opinion, assaulted the way that the Democrats are currently taking it apart. We've had a system to impeach any president on the books for 246 years. However, they felt the need, just one party, not the entire House of Representatives, um, and not, not uh, you know, a consensus of everyone, okay. but right. just one party decided we're going to rewrite the rules because we don't like this president. That's not the intention of impeachment. It's not a recall election. It's not a, you know, in case of emergency, break glass. It's a process to impeach someone from the presidency so that they can then stand trial in the Senate. And I think it's this, I want to say, misunderstanding of our Constitution, but sadly, I don't think it's a misunderstanding. I don't think that it's being misunderstood. I think it's being misused. Okay, misused. Misused maliciously. And that's sad. You, I, I get the sense you're talking about a, a lack of respect for that. Sure, a lack of respect, and I think more so, I'm going to say, prostituting parliamentary maneuvers so that you can get a certain outcome, irrespective of the facts. Rich, you know, it almost sounds to me like you're saying that uh, a lot of Hispanics have just kind of been misled um, in terms of, you know, how to, how to think about politics in America. Is, it, is that an accurate characterization? Sure. And, and I mean, I would go a step further to say that I, while I love America and I know that we have so many freedoms and liberty here, it doesn't mean that the threat and the ideology espoused by tyrants like Stalin, like Mao, have not encroached on our culture, specifically amongst Hispanics. When you have a poll that comes out that says that 75% of millennial voters favor some sort of socialism and are open to considering communism, it tells me they don't know anything about that they probably ought to read a book or meet somebody who's come from Venezuela, who's had to cook their own dog so that they can have food for their family. Someone who's come from Cuba, who, like I mentioned earlier, might have to hold on to the inner tube of a tire to get across from Havana to Miami so that they can live a life of opportunity in America. Well, that's the thing, right? The, the new immigrants, uh, certainly ones that come out of, you know, communist uh, dictatorships and socialist states, tend to be pretty clear on the not, not liking that system. But I, don't, I, but I also don't think that uh, that's the way that um, 
let, let's say, kind of left-leaning ideology in America is portrayed either, right? Well, I think it's been secretive. Like you said earlier, I, it almost sounds like they're being misled, and, and that's exactly how you mislead someone. When you have someone that harps on inequity across, across the board and uses race as the main bait to, to talk about this inequity and uses race as a wedge and tells someone that because you are brown, because you are black, because you are uh, whatever minority group they want to pigeonhole you into, mm. you have less. There is an issue of inequity because of this. And because this person favors a set of ideas that you don't like, this person is somehow less moral. We have really gone into the territory of propaganda. Th this is alarming to me, and I see it happening more and more and more, and this is why I do what I do on different levels. It's why I promote more sound education policies and practices. It's why I talk to people in the media. It's why I have a radio program. It's why I do so many of the things that I do, because if we don't stop bad ideas, they're like weeds. They keep growing back. You pluck one, you get three. So, you know, I, I get the sense that you're here talking about, you know, progressive uh, ideology. And, and so what is, in your view, what's the relationship of that to communist ideology? Cause it seems like you're kind of connecting the two. Yeah, so I think that there's, there's internal turmoil in the leftist progressive wing of American politics where there are people that truly believe that we need to get money out of politics, that we need less cronyism. I would support those people. I agree with those, with those two tenets. It's when we get out of hand to things like the Green New Deal where you're proposing something with a price tag that's literally unattainable. And the response to it becomes, well, if we limit the military budget, reduce our military budget, we might be able to afford more government-dependent green programs. You know, the reality is programs like the Green New Deal are not designed to benefit the environment. They're designed to change the way that we conduct our business. They're designed to change the economic system we use. And in this situation, it's designed to eliminate capitalism and introduce socialism. I've heard that, uh, you know, alleged certainly with, uh, yeah. with the Green New Deal and, and uh, kind of a range of other programs. Is it, so is the only solution in your mind, you know, you just basically you want to try to set things up to limit the powers of government? Initially, of course. I think we should always be cautious of a government that is somehow more powerful than the people. Our goal should always be liberty, not tyranny. And that's where we'll end up. And that's how we got here. It was that rebellion toward tyranny, towards telling King George, you can't send your redcoat soldiers into my house. You can't have more of my money. You can't tell me where I need to pray. Th these, these were the challenges that sparked the revolution. And I think it's important that we never forget them because the old saying, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. What do you think is the most important message that you try to share with you know, fellow Hispanics, let's say, who you, like you say, who you don't, you don't believe have all the facts? Well, I, I like to bring it back to, to, have, to being on an equal playing field and kind of letting everybody know that as Hispanics, I think there are certain universal truths that we all can agree on. Most of us like rice, right? <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but another thing that I think most of us can agree on is that we don't want to be supported by the government. Hmm. I think most Hispanics take pride in doing their own thing. Mm. Go to, you know, I was in Dominican Republic several years back, driving down the countryside. Every three or four miles, you'd see somebody that would take the time to climb the tree and get the coconuts. Chop them up and serve them on ice. Entrepreneurship, 
entrepreneurship, that level of industriousness is innate with Hispanics. This idea that there is a big brother government or that the government will be our daddy is not a mainstay of the Hispanic culture. So I think when you have a frank conversation with Hispanics, most of them will say, yeah, right on, you're right. The, the, just walking here, walk down 8th Avenue and 36th Street, there's a woman there, Central South American, she's got a shopping cart with a board on top of it and she slices up mangoes. She puts them in a Ziploc bag and sells them for triple the price of what she paid for the mango at the market. Entrepreneurship, industriousness, not looking for a handout. Ronald Reagan was famous for saying, Hispanics are conservatives. They just haven't realized it yet. Uh-huh. <laughs> Rich, based on what you're describing, um, it's still really hard to fathom how you know a whole group of people uh, might believe that they're ideologically in one camp versus you asserting that they're actually in a very different place. How does that work? Lies, lies. With a it's the encroachment of propaganda. It's telling people that that somehow there's this inequity that they can only solve if we now come to the the college that we have and we're going to teach you about Latin American studies and women's studies and it, it's Marxism on display. Mm. Marx wanted to separate everybody into different classes and categories. Why? Because it's easier to control the masses that way. This is exactly what you see on, the, you tell me, you're more or less my age, what was the purpose and who was doing it? Who studied women's studies? In, when we were children. And what, what were they doing? What were their jobs? It wasn't a thing. It was just becoming a thing. Mm. And, it was, and it, it, within higher ed, it was designed to create a place to have people that can feel like there's inequity going on. You feel like there's an issue of inequity with women? Great. Welcome to the Department of Women's Studies. And now you have this bastion that you can create and shape and do things with. You are Latinos? Great. We have now Latin American studies. Our black friends? African American studies. Why? Why must we segment everything if we're all in the same place? Very simple reason. It's designed to be divisive. Divide and conquer. Once you do that, then you can start peddling whatever message it is that you like. And again, I'm not making this up. Just take it to page out of Stalin's playbook. Stalin says that we must own the means of production. And to get there, we have to own the means of education, the means of instruction, and the means of information. So I got to tell you what you're going to read in your newspaper. I got to tell you what you're going to hear on your television. I've got to tell you what you're going to hear on the radio before you can hear it. That's not liberty, and that's definitely not America. And so you're concerned that things have gone that way, obviously, way too far. Absolutely. People have embraced the left, making it look like a hero, <laughs> making it look like Stalin and Mao were some sort of heroic figure. And I, I say that hyperbolically. Of course, nobody thinks Stalin was a hero. However, you, you take the Soviet Constitution, and you read it word for word, you can copy and paste paragraphs, entire paragraphs of the Soviet Constitution and juxtapose them on Senator Bernie Sanders' current campaign platform, and they fit like a glove. Fascinating. Although, you know, we, we, we know that he, is, he was very, very positively inclined towards, towards the Soviet Union, I think. Of course, yeah. but when you have armies of young people feeling the burn, <laughs> embracing ideas that literally cost thousands of people their lives and destroyed countries, but it's repackaged, warmed over, and being sold again as a new bill of goods that's somehow good for you this time. Only difference, you know less. You haven't read the classics. You're not you're not up to speed on what may have happened in the Eastern Bloc 
50, 60, 70, 100 years ago. That's the difference. So I think the key is we need to take back the institutions that have been taken from us. Public education, private education, university education, various levels of government, and every part of the media. It's clear what you're doing uh, about this. You know, yeah. you've basically you're, you've decided to be in media to, to do it. What, what about in our audience? I'm sure there's a number of people watching that are, that are very concerned about what you're talking about. What, what, what should they be doing? You know, it's, I'm so happy you asked that because that happens to be the number one question that I hear every single day from, from everything that we do. I hear, what can we do? What are we supposed to do? How do we, what do we do? And the reality is, again, there are so many people that are willing patriots saying, I'll give my life for this country. And my response to them is, you don't need to give your life for the country but you do need to give your career. You may need to give your free time. You may need to give your retirement. I believe that the ideological battle that's going on in America right now is a serious one, a very serious one that it, it, you can no longer say, I'm a truck driver and I'm gonna keep driving trucks. You can, but you'd be serving your country a lot better if you were more engaged civically. I think we've gone way beyond sharing positive messages or political messages mm -hmm. on Facebook and Twitter. It's no longer about calling talk radio and telling them, you know what you ought to do? I think it's time we look in the mirror and say, here's what I'm gonna do. And it, this goes beyond the ballot box. This is about taking back ideas, embracing American exceptionalism, and making America great again. Rich Valdez, such a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Jan.